Afternoon and welcome. My name is Kylie Whitehead and I am the Western Australian Branch Manager of the Australian Water Association. Uh, we're presenting from different locations today. Um, so please bear with us. We don't have any professional IT infrastructure and if we encounter any hiccups or lose presenters due to any unstable inter internet connections, we will endeavour to get everybody back online as quickly as possible. We have participants today from across the country, so I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from where we all sit, their spirits and ancestors, and the contributions that our Indigenous people and cultures make to this great nation that we share together. If you have any questions for our speakers throughout the day, please type them in via the Q&A function, which will be appearing at the bottom of your screen. At the end of each presentation, we will endeavour to answer some questions if time permits. I also advise that this session is being recorded today and may be shared publicly, so please be mindful of this if the opportunity arises to ask questions. I will now hand you over to our MC for today, WA Branch, Branch Vice President, Peter Spencer. Thank you. Thanks, Kylie, and uh, yeah, good afternoon to everyone. We're in this new world of webinars and acknowledging traditional custodians from all over the country, but uh, I guess it's timely we're on the, the first day of our National Reconciliation Week, so I'd like to give a specific acknowledgement to the traditional custodians of which I and my fellow presenters are meeting on, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contribution to the life of this city and this region here in Western Australia. So a quick overview of proceedings. Uh, each speaker will have uh, in the order of 10 to 15 minutes to talk uh, and present theirs. We're aiming as a bit of an overview of the subject of uh, water in hydrogen and some of their specific projects in that space. We uh, welcome questions via Q&A. If we have time uh, at the end of each uh, uh, talk, we will cover some of the questions, but we may not. Uh, again, if we have time at the end, we may follow up on some. Uh, and then failing that, we can follow up uh, post the event as well. Uh, so today you'll be hearing from uh, a number of speakers. I'm pleased to say our keynote speaker will be Professor Peter Clinken, the Chief Scientist of WA, and followed by Martin Ander from Murdoch University, uh, Luke Cox from Hazer Group, Sam Lee Mohan from ATCO, and Joe Wider from the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation. And so with that, I think uh, I'll introduce uh, Professor Peter Clinken and uh, for him to, to get underway with his presentation. Um, Professor Clinken is a, a leading West Australian medical research scientist, highly regarded for his work in advancing the understanding of genes involved in leukaemia, cancer and anemia. Professor Clinken has brought a wealth of knowledge and expertise to the role of Chief Scientist of Western Australia, providing independent expert advice to the state government and supports the government in growing the state science industries to achieve future prosperity for Western Australians, as well as assisting with changes to legislation. I'll now hand over to Peter Clinken. Cool. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, can I start off uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, of this land that we meet on, um, the Noongar people, um, in their language. Uh, so say, Kaya Nunakot, Nanjurupan Nijiye, Nija Wajak, Noongar Buja, Nanjkatich Noongar Briti Mamad Briti Yoga, Kura Kura, Oyeye. So uh, this is the land of the Noongar people, particularly the Wajak clan. I acknowledge their elders past and present. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today. So uh, a disclaimer up front, I'm not a hydrogen expert. Okay, so uh, I get to see lots and lots of things uh, as the Chief Scientist of Western Australia. I see lots of opportunities and hydrogen is probably one of the most exciting opportunities uh, to come along at the moment. So we live in incredibly interesting times. Uh, up till a few months ago, you would have said it was exciting times because we were going through industry 3.0 slash 4.0 simultaneously, the third and the fourth industrial revolutions probably the fastest pace of change humankind has ever experienced. And we've gone from the 1980s with the digital revolution, the internet and so on, into a period now of great technological convergence. We've got AI, we've got big data, we've got analytics, all sorts of things coming together in this massive uh, change uh, period. Wonderful opportunities, but also a number of challenges that we face. 
Interestingly, with each industrial revolution, if you go back to the first industrial revolution, and there are only a few of us who are old enough to remember that one. That's a joke, okay? Sorry, uh, dad jokes don't get any better. Uh, just suck them up. Uh, in the first industrial revolution, we went essentially from wood to, to coal. Second industrial revolution, new energy form in oil and gas came along. And now in the third and the fourth industrial revolutions, we're seeing the emergence of renewables. And the renewables including solar, wind, battery storage, and hydrogen, of course. So it, it's interesting to look at the mix of energy consumption globally. And at the moment, about 85% of our energy consumption is coming from fossil fuels. I'm looking in very in broad terms here. 5% from nuclear, 5% from hydro, and 5% from renewables. If you're looking at electricity, uh, coal and gas make up roughly 65%, hydro 20%, nuclear 10, and renewables 5. So there's a massive opportunity for renewables to take up a lot of space in, uh, in the energy area. And hydrogen is going to be, I believe, a key element in, in all of this. Currently, hydrogen is used for all sorts of different things, uh, not the least being chemical synthesis for um, compounds such as ammonia, petrochemicals, glass, etc. It's, it's rocket fuel. Right? It's used by NASA and Ariane and the Russians to propel their rockets into space. And that's because the amount of energy that you get out of hydrogen is probably about three times on a per kilo basis that which you get from, uh, uh, from petrol. Hydrogen can also be used to complement natural gas, and we'll be hearing from ATCO uh, in, this, uh, in, in this symposium or this forum around blended uh, uh, gas production, which is a great opportunity. Hydrogen can also be used in fuel cells to produce electricity. And from my perspective, one of the big opportunities for Australia is around transport. Transport is a massive user of energy, particularly in a large country like Australia, and where we've got our, our cities in particular distributed uh, so widely. So buses, uh, heavy haulage trucks, even trains, and potentially even ships could be fueled by hydrogen. And I, I like the idea of ships removing bunker oil because that's one of the dirtiest fuels out there. So massive opportunities for hydrogen up till you now and, and, and still ongoing, there are challenges associated with the uses of hydrogen and some of them have been around storage because of density issues. Uh, it's because it's so small, it's very diffusible. Combustibility, well, that's not a, not, not a surprise because you know anything that's flammable or explosive uh, uh, creates challenges. Uh, but transportation of, um, of a hydrogen has been an issue. Uh, and, and how you could transport liquid hydrogen uh, in a compact form uh, has been a challenge. Until recently, the Jap uh, until last year actually, the Japanese launched a vessel uh, which now is able to, to transport uh, liquid hydrogen. The one of the alternatives is to actually use ammonia as a vehicle for transporting hydrogen. But a lot of these challenges are being overcome and being overcome, in my view, in a, in a remarkably rapid rate. I haven't seen changes like this um, you know, for, for a long time in any particular field. And it's fascinating for me that the large multinational oil and gas companies are now including hydrogen in amongst their energy profiles. So they clearly see hydrogen as part of their future and part of the future mix of, of energy sources for the globe. If we're looking at the current sources of, uh, of hydrogen production, almost all of hydrogen produced now around about 95, 96% from, from what I can read, comes from what's called brown or gray hydrogen. That has the advantage of low cost, but it also has the significant problem associated with carbon dioxide emissions. So if we're looking at brown hydrogen, which is essentially taking coal and gasifying coal, you, you mix the coal, go through a series of chemical reactions, uh, blend it with water, and you end up with hydrogen, but you also release carbon dioxide. And therein lies part of the dilemma. Interestingly, in Victoria, uh, the Kawasaki uh, uh, company has uh, uh, entered into a, uh, a contract with Victoria uh, around producing hydrogen from brown coal. 
and they will be transported by uh, by ship. Um, and uh, the plan is after a successful pilot phase that the carbon dioxide that is generated through brown coal or through brown hydrogen uh, would be sequestered away. Grey hydrogen, on the other hand, comes from natural gas and that uh, requires a process called steam methane reformation. And essentially, once again, you take methane, CH4, you mix it with water, go through a series of chemical reactions and you produce hydrogen, but you also produce carbon dioxide, thereby, uh, thereby contributing to emissions. If, however, you take that to another level and produce what's called blue hydrogen, you use the same processes around methane, the natural gas, mixing that with water to produce hydrogen, but you sequester the carbon dioxide. You use carbon capture sequestration, CCS, to remove the hydrogen and store it away. This is expensive and this is tricky. An alternative is to use biosequestration and plant lots of trees that would absorb carbon dioxide to compensate for uh, the release of carbon dioxide. In, in terms of carbon capture and sequestration, it's really relevant to note that Chevron uh, announced last year that as part of their LNG facility uh, at, the Gorgon, at the Gorgon LNG uh, facility uh, on Barrow Island, uh, they, they've been managed to be quite successful in CCS. Now they haven't reached maximum capacity yet, but this is probably one of the largest uh, commercial attempts uh, and success, uh, moderately successful attempts so far uh, at carbon capture and, st and storage. It's a real challenge, uh, but this is a really interesting development. So finally, if we, if we sorry, not finally, there's two more. There's, there's green hydrogen, and that involves the electrolysis of water. So essentially you take an electric current, you hydrolyze water, you split it up, uh, you have oxygen being produced and hydrogen being captured. So that is a, a great way of using renewable energy to produce clean hydrogen. Therefore, it's called green hydrogen. Somewhat more expensive than the current uh, uh, processes, but importantly, the costs of these processes uh, in terms of electrolyzers are coming down quite considerably. I'm really excited about the last one, which is the Hazer process. And you can stop smiling, Luke, because you know that I'm one of your great fans. Um, I, I, I still am blown away by this because this is homegrown uh, West Australian slash Australian technology from the University of Western Australia. And, you know, if you were to come up with a dream molecule and a dream process, I think the Hazer process is it. Essentially, you just crack methane, you produce carbon, graphite, which is useful in all sorts of different things, not the least being lithium ion batteries and you produce hydrogen using iron ore or iron oxide as a, as a catalyst. I'm sure you'll, you'll get more details from Luke on that. But uh, I, I think that is a marvelous, marvelous uh, development. I can't wait to see, uh, to hear more about it and actually see that being scaled up. So for me, um, I guess this is one of Australia's great opportunities. You know, we've got a potential export industry. There's a new form of energy on the block and it, it, it enables us to undergo a transition towards uh, a renewable uh, energy out, uh, outputs. Ross Garno, um, I've got here on my desk, Ross Garno produced this book called Superpower, Australia's Opportunity in the Low Carbon World. I think it's a really interesting set of uh, ideas that Ross has produced uh, around renewables, but as an economist, he can, he can provide uh, the, the detailed economic analysis that I as a crazy chief scientist can't. So, you know, that, that gives me a, uh, a lot of comfort, I got to tell you when I see that. One of the things that he talks about in that book is the, the potential for use of producing green steel. And instead of using iron ore mixed with carbon to produce steel and releasing carbon dioxide, which produces between seven and 10% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. You can use hydrogen to replace carbon so that you end up with iron or steel and you produce water. Now, the Northwest of Western Australia would be an ideal place to do that because there are bucket loads of iron ore. Oh, someone's disagreeing. I think Martin's gonna disagree with me on that one. Well, that's gonna be an interesting conversation. <laughs> I still think it's an interesting opportunity, Martin. I look forward to hearing your analysis. Um, 
but if, if we're looking at uh, the energy mix in, in, in uh, Western Australia at the moment, we're in a fortunate position where we've got our base load well and truly covered through, um, through natural gas and through coal. The aging coal fired stations are being switched off. So there's an opportunity to, uh, to compensate that or to complement that with, uh, with renewables. We've got abundant uh, uh, solar uh, capability. We've got uh, abundant um, wind opportunities in Western Australia. And if you combine that with all the elements necessary to make lithium ion batteries, we really are in an excellent position to do that transition. So I guess I, I, I'm excited by the opportunities that are before us. Clearly there'll be uh, challenges uh, that will occur. Uh, some of the ideas will not come to fruition. Some of them will just not be in the right time. Some of them will be just not economically viable. But just give you some of the projects that, uh, are, that I've been hearing about uh, here in Western Australia uh, recently. Um, about 40% of the, the country's uh, publicly announced hydrogen projects are actually based here in Western Australia. There is the Hydrogen Renewables Australia uh, uh, consortium with Siemens, which is in the Midwest of Western Australia, where there is considerable wind and solar opportunities. Their plan is to produce green hydrogen. There, are, there is Yarra and Angers in the, the Northwest, where they are planning to produce green hydrogen for ammonia and use that as fertilizers. And that reduces their need for, for gray hydrogen and carbon dioxide emissions. There's the Asian Renewable Hub also in the Northwest, uh, which has renewables based, on, on, uh, based for hydrogen production. Uh, the FMG uh, uh, Fortescue Metal Group is combining with CSIRO to look at green hydrogen for exports. We've got Hazer, we'll be hearing about shortly, and we've got ACO that have got a, a pilot plant for domestic use uh, of hydrogen. So there are lots of things that are happening. Uh, I, 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 I can't wait to see the maturation of each of these project, uh, projects. Uh, it's an incredibly exciting time uh, for new technologies in Western Australia and Australia as a whole. I see this as a moment where we need to grasp the opportunities in front of us. We have a number of comparative advantages. What we need to do is to translate them into competitive advantages for the good of this, this nation. On that note, I'll stop preaching and I'll, uh, uh, I'm happy to take questions or move right along. Thanks, Peter. Right. Uh, thank you, Peter Clinkin. It's here we need the, the canned applause to come in, don't we? Uh, but uh, yeah, an excellent uh, summary, really good introduction. Uh, a lot of enthusiasm there and uh, probably the, the takeaway for me is just what an opportunity we have for our own domestically grown industry here, um, which in these current times is, is getting a lot of focus about what can we do. Um, I'm listening to you there, I'm thinking we can do all of this here. So uh, yeah, very exciting. Can I, just, can I just interject there, sir, Peter, and just say, not we can do it, we should do it and we must do it. Yeah, yeah, uh, well put. So yeah, thank you. Uh, we'll uh, we'll move on and uh, to our next speaker, and uh, I'll keep collecting questions and answers as we go, and uh, uh, we'll see if we get time to get to cover some of, some of them. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker now is uh, Dr. Martin Ander. He's an environmental engineer with over thirty years' experience in the energy, water, and construction sectors since completing a Bachelor of Engineering Mechanical. After working with consulting engineering firms on large industrial energy projects, he spent 15 years working in remote indigenous communities across Australia and developing countries. Today, Martin manages postgraduate researchers in a group called Environmental Engineering and Living Systems on industry-focused research projects and conducts a range of renewable energy, water and waste related projects and teaching across Indonesia. With his colleagues at Murdoch Unity, U University, he's now working on a number of hydrogen energy projects. Welcome, Martin. Uh, hello, Peter, and hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, firstly, to AWA, Kylie, thanks uh, for this invitation. And Peter Spencer, thanks very much for uh, setting this up through AWA. Um, I, I guess you in the uh, uh, Water Corporation um, and uh, the water industry generally are going to have a big role in the uh, future of the hydrogen industry in, um, in Western Australia, given that, uh, you know, this is, uh, water is a key part of the hydrogen cycle. And, um, and thanks very much, uh, Professor Peter Clinken, uh, really inspirational. Geez, we really got to get to work now after your really heartwarming and inspirational uh, talk there. It's fantastic to know that 
uh, we've got you there supporting uh, this opportunity in Western Australia. And, and like uh, uh, Professor Peter Clinken, I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners. I'm here at Murdoch University on Noongar country as well, but actually the projects I'll be uh, talking about briefly um, that we're starting uh, from here at Murdoch University and uh, with our various industry partners and our various actually uh, indigenous partners as well, because um, we'll be working in the uh, Pilbara region uh, over the coming months. And um, so I'd like to acknowledge our uh, uh, traditional owners uh, in the North as well that we'll be um, working with. Uh, but like uh, Petty Clinken too, I certainly wouldn't claim to be a hydrogen expert uh, yet. Uh, I'm more coming at it from uh, applications, engineering and design, but certainly that's our goal here at Murdoch University. We've got um, um, a great team of colleagues here in our engineering and energy discipline. And so there's a team of us um, that have put together these proposals that we're only just starting yet, which I wanted to talk briefly with you uh, today. Uh, there's two projects we're starting, uh, both in the Pilbara region actually, and thanks to the WA uh, Renewable Hydrogen Fund, uh, we um, are gonna be working on um, um, a project in the Pilbara region as a, a feasibility study for this um, hybrid PV battery hydrogen system microgrid. Um, and we've also actually just uh, about to start a new uh, study with um, one of the local governments in the uh, Pilbara region because they see themselves as a, in a key position for the emerging hydrogen industry. So um, what we uh, expect to do is um, learn a lot from these studies and with our industry partners, um, build up uh, capacity here at Murdoch University to contribute to the growth of the industry in Western Australia. So let me start then. Um, okay, I'm just trying to get down to the next slide. Ah, oh, there it is. Ah, uh, there's a delay. That's right. Sorry, everyone. I've uh, got to remember with my slide controls, there's a bit of a delay when we're in this um, webinar mode. So um, this is how we're starting the role of uh, water in uh, renewable hydrogen uh, with my colleagues here at Murdoch University, uh, in particular, uh, Farhat Dawood. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, uh, GM Shafiullah and Manikam uh, um, that we're working with here in our engineering team. So uh, why hydrogen? Well, Professor Peter Glinken has uh, given us some background, but let me just say um, we see this as a sustainable zero emissions uh, source. It's renewable hydrogen. And uh, as, as Peter Clinken's already explained, green hydrogen, we can go up to a large scale of production um, using modular components, which uh, both that and the hydrogen are storable and transportable. Um, um, we're suitable for grid and off-grid renewable energy storage applications. And, and of course, then we can move into power regeneration uh, for, uh, via fuel cell technologies and uh, actually use it as a direct fuel also in um, uh, transport and industry. Uh, we have a long discharge duration in these systems and 100% uh, depth of discharge. And we can integrate these into the existing energy and transport systems as we'll um, hear from our following speakers. And also as uh, Professor Peter Clinken has mentioned, the big hope is uh, the brave new world for Western Australia that we're all uh, batting for is the whole solar hydrogen uh, export industry here in Western Australia. So, but our focus is uh, renewable hydrogen, the, the conversion, uh, uh, renewable electricity into chemical energy um, uh, in the form of hydrogen by electrolysis. So we're um, basically splitting water molecules and we do this with electrolyzers. Uh, so there's several types, um, alkaline electrolysis, proton exchange membrane, solid oxide electrolyzers. And um, so, yeah, that's the basic equation you can see there, uh, splitting the H2O molecule um, into its uh, components of hydrogen and oxygen. And just some um, fun facts here, uh, briefly. Um, a mole of water will release uh, one mole of hydrogen and half a mole of oxygen. And one litre of water at standard temperature and pressure is 55.54 mole. And at standard temperature and pressure, the volume of one mole of gas is 22.4 litres. And so the volume of hydrogen collected 
will be 1,244 uh, litres per litre of water. And just that diagram uh, on the right there, just a conceptual diagram showing the anode and cathode, how we're able to generate um, uh, the hydrogen in that uh, electrolysis process. And it, what we can see here is just an example of an electrolyzer uh, using uh, renewables, uh, the proton exchange membrane or the PEM uh, membrane, uh, the membrane there between the cathode and the an anode, um, producing the um, hydrogen using renewable energy. So that's the background. And then just moving into um, the studies that we'll embark on. Um, um, in fact, we're just signing the contracts now. So we're um, get, getting ready to have a, quite a vigorous uh, next uh, six months, uh, actually working in the Pilbara region. Um, and so uh, there we have um, a particular indigenous organization that's very keen to um, you know, understand its potential potential future role in the uh, future hydrogen uh, industry and uh, associated opportunities. In this particular case, we're looking at um, working with them on a feasibility study uh, to see if we can have a 100% uh, standalone uh, microgrid power system. And, and we're working with uh, several industry partners that have the capability to um, provide those system components and um, um, actually build those systems. So, you know, we hope that the feasibility study uh, that we embark upon um, could one day actually lead to a pilot plant uh, in the Pilbara. And so for the particular community that we'll be uh, modelling and, well, working with, uh, we expect a daily average load in the order of two megawatt hours. And, um, and the idea is to uh, design and hopefully one day build a 100% renewable energy standalone microgrid system. And so this is essentially a hybrid solar PV battery hydrogen uh, system. And <clears throat> we'll have a renewable energy powered water treatment reverse osmosis uh, system uh, to provide the high quali quality feed water that's necessary. And interestingly, uh, quite separately to all this, um, uh, another line of our work is, is um, quite strongly in the um, uh, renewable energy powered uh, desalination small scale systems. So already actually with this particular organisation, we are working with um, uh, building up a, um, a pilot plant alongside their existing um, community water supply system in one of these remote uh, indigenous communities. Uh, to build a, a unique um, small-scale RO plant uh, that will operate in parallel with it, uh, with the uh, community water supply system, and uh, um, provide a, a drinking water source that, of a much higher quality than what they currently have. Uh, but of course, RO is normally very expensive, and, and we're developing a new type of auto blending device um, here at Murdoch University that will mean that we can use a, a much smaller RO component to the overall system and just meet the drinking water needs uh, by piggybacking onto the existing system and thereby uh, reducing uh, capital costs. And so we hope this will have spin-off benefits into this new hydrogen energy system that we're, 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 we'll be working on, uh, working towards as well. Just waiting for that slide to change. There we go. So here's a very early conceptual model of the system that we're proposing, um, the 100% renewable energy, hydrogen-based uh, standalone microgrid model, um, two megawatt hours per day module. Um, and so the idea is uh, initial thinking, uh, and of course we've got a lot more work to do this, is um, as you can see here in this concept diagram, is we've got some way of um, RO treatment of the water and deionizing, um, running that um, off a solar PV system. You know, maybe that's going to be in the order of a megawatt to power both the RO plant and the community and the hydrogen system, uh, feeding both the water and the power into the electrolyzer, which, uh, you know, we estimate at this stage, if, although we haven't started in the order of a 250 kilowatt electrolyzer. 
Um, we could vent off the oxygen to the um, uh, wastewater treatment plant, but of course, we'll be working with a very small uh, Aboriginal community. So it's most likely just gonna have septic tanks and um, um, but uh, may have sewage lagoons. Uh, and so there may not be the opportunity to, to use that oxygen directly into the treatment, wastewater treatment process. But then um, of course the hydrogen, which uh, is, is the main um, item on the menu, uh, will go into the storage uh, tanks uh, and then into the fuel cells and, um, and then into the power supply um, for that community. And uh, again, um, you know, providing power into the water treatment systems. So again, just there some um, fun facts, uh, feed water consumption, uh, the hydrogen production and the water required uh, for electrolysis is about 50 litres per hour. So of course, you know, for a community like this, not, not a large amount of water. And so again, uh, we wouldn't need to have a large uh, water treatment plant to go with that. Uh, and in fact, we can also reclaim water from the fuel cell e exhaust uh, and condense that off as well. So uh, overall then, we expect, although more work to be done, uh, the overall system cost to be in the order of uh, three or four million dollars. And uh, just moving to the next slide, just waiting for that to come up. The, um, what we're also keen to look at, uh, is a project whereby the focus, um, while it's still a hydrogen energy project, um, this uh, concept diagram here is just giving us a, a conceptual layout of how we hope in, in a future project where there's a larger wastewater treatment plant, where we, we really would focus more on uh, dedicating the oxygen vented uh, to optimise the performance of the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps the outcome of that is, is reduced uh, energy running costs in the, in the treatment plant. And so in this particular model, um, for this scale community, we think that the uh, overall system cost uh, would be um, about uh, $2 million. So I can finish there um, if we go to the next slide um, and um, wrap up. So if we just go to the last slide, um, we hope from all of that, that we'll develop enough new knowledge to start a new course in hydrogen energy. And then we're starting a new master's program shortly here in Murdoch University that we would uh, feed that into as well. So thanks very much everyone and happy to take any uh, questions or emails from you. Yeah, thanks Martin. Um, we uh, probably just have time for one quick question. It was one that was crossing my mind, but we've had it from a few others too. The, the total amount of water, so you, know, you, you explain the, the molar ratio up front, but then obviously you've got the, the losses through the system uh, and then also the losses through the water treatment system as well. So um, for that Pilbara case study, two megawatt hour uh, daily load, um, the amount of water you're gonna need per day to feed that system yeah, well, look, um, I think in that very early conceptual model, what we were saying about 50 litres per hour, um, and of course, um, when we get up there, we'll be looking at um, getting uh, analysis of the uh, water quality there, which will be uh, a groundwater source. And, you know, it's almost going to be brackish. Um, so, you know, we'll need RO treatment, and we're planning to do that separately anyway in another project. Um, and so I guess it's um, um, the recovery rate that we set uh, in the RO plant, which will, and, and the subsequent treatment that we might need, which will dictate um, actually how much feed water we do need. But you can see from that uh, 50 uh, litres uh, per hour in the, what we've estimated to be the size of the hydrogen energy system, um, you know, roughly 300 litres per day, um, you're talking about quite, quite small uh, volumes of water anyway, even if you doubled that to allow for the uh, losses and even with a low uh, recovery rate in the RO plant to make it last longer of, you know, even as low as uh, 20 or 30%, um, you know, even if you, you tripled that 
600 litres uh, a day uh, in that order, you're still not talking about a lot of water for a community scale energy system. Uh, but of course, it has to be high quality. And so we do need a, a treatment plant uh, to do that. And in this case, it would be a very small plant. So in fact, it would only be a, a small part of the system cost in order to get the necessary quality of, of water that you need. Well, thanks, Martin. Uh, yep, I think we've you know, scratched the surface of what is going to be an area for a lot of optimization around the, the water cycle with these plants. But uh, thanks for your presentation, um, introduction to your projects. I'll, uh, I'll move on now to our next speaker, and I'd like to introduce uh, Luke Cox uh, from Hazer Group. Hazer Group is an ASX listed technology development company undertaking the commercialization of the Hazer process, a low emissions hydrogen and graphite production process. As commercial manager with Hazer Group, Luke's responsible for commercialization and growth of the company by identifying and developing opportunities for applications of the Hazer process and the associated partnerships, both in Australia and overseas. And I guess I can add that it's out in public now that we've uh, signed an agreement with the Hazer Group, that's uh, uh, my employer, Watercorp, to uh, allow them to build a, a demonstration plant at our Woodman Point treatment plant. And I'm sure Luke will have more to say about that. So welcome, Luke. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Peter and Carly, um, the Australian Water Association, for the opportunity to uh, to join in this uh, this webinar today. Uh, it is uh, a sad circumstance that we can't meet in person, but have to do this online. Uh, it does, however, also enable um, our industry friends from the East Coast to join us. So, a particular welcome to the people on the East Coast. Thank you for for joining us. You, looking at the time, might be having your dinner, have had your dinner. Hope you're having a pleasant evening. Anyway. Um, See if the control works. Yeah, as uh, as Peter said, uh, Hazer is a um, technology development company listed on the uh, Australian Stock Exchange. The, uh, the technology originated from the University of Western Australia, UWA, here in Perth, as uh, as Peter Klinker mentioned. Um, we're, we're very excited to be part of the, uh, the hydrogen industry that is emerging in Australia and, uh, and globally. And hopefully in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this brief presentation, I'll give you uh, an introduction on um, what we do, what we're doing next, as Peter uh, Spencer alluded to, and, uh, and how we think uh, we have something, uh, something very different to offer uh, with our technology. So as Professor Klinken already mentioned, um, at present, a lot of um, hydrogen is already uh, used in, in um, chemical processes, in fossil fuel reforming, um, production of fertilizer. That typically uh, tends to be produced by a process called steam methane reforming, which is the splitting of uh, methane molecules, so CH4, uh, into H2, which is a hydrogen gas, and CO2, unfortunately, for, for those um, production methods. Um, all the excitement today, uh, obviously, uh, leading into this webinar as well, is around the, the significant drop in renewable energy uh, prices, which uh, enable the commercial application of electrolysis, the splitting of water, which we, we do, we've heard about. Um, however, it still requires a lot of energy, um, and that needs to be sourced from somewhere, be it purchased, be, be it generated. And for this, uh, this purpose, this audience particularly, uh, it does also require uh, water. Um, and as Martin already uh, indicated, not just water, uh, but it actually is RO plus water. So if we're looking at scale, and we're considering, for instance, um, projects that would be looking at exporting vast amounts of, uh, of renewable hydrogen, it does become a factor. Uh, I've got a background in the, in the water industry, uh, some of you that join us uh, might be industry friends from the water industry, so I am a bit biased towards this, uh, this topic, but it's, it's something we cannot ignore. Um, so two barriers to entry uh, for that market, and this is where we believe Hazel brings something different. So there's a fairly long lag on the slides. Thank you. 
Yeah, this one, please. So this is the um, an overview of the HAZER process. So we don't start with electrons like electrolysis. We start with the versatility of a molecule, a methane molecule, CH4, and we split that um, into hydrogen and the carbon, the C of the CH4, gets captured as solid graphite, solid carbon, so a, a solid material, no CO2 uh, emissions from the, from the process. Uh, it's done through a process called thermocatalytic methane decomposition, which is a fancy way of saying methane cracking over a catalyst. So we use iron ore um, as, a, as a process catalyst to reduce the amount of energy required for the, uh, the process to occur. Um, to give you an idea, the process runs at approximately 850, 900 degrees Celsius. Um, but the, the catalyst, the, the most clever bit about the whole uh, HAZER process is the fact that this catalyst is iron ore and is uh, very commonly available and uh, cost effective um, catalyst. Whereas other processes that use catalysts have started to, started to use more and more exotic materials uh, such as platinum or zinc oxides, which are expensive to, uh, to use in the process. They are so valuable that they need to be recovered, which make your plant setup more expensive ultimately leads into a, a more expensive um, product. So simple um, process um, configuration, cheap uh, catalyst, starting with a versatile uh, methane molecule, splitting it into two products and no waste byproducts, no water required. Um, the methane obviously can come from, um, from fossil fuel um, sources, natural gas. All right, I'm having a real struggle with the lag here. Um, but as, uh, as most of you in the water industry probably also aware, you can also find methane uh, in a renewable form, uh, biogas from, from wastewater treatment plants, uh, landfills produce um, significant volumes of renewable methane. Um, so in this diagram, you see uh, what we believe is a, an, a good example of how HAZER could, uh, could play a role in a circular economy by producing uh, two valuable products from, from biogas. We use the, the hydrogen, for example, to, um, as a fuel for public transport, uh, to transport the people in the community, which produce the waste from which the biogas gets, uh, gets sourced. A circular economy. Um, what is particularly interesting is um, if we use renewable methane, biogas, as a feedstock for the HAZER process, uh, because we have no emissions from the process itself, no CO2 emissions, um, the process effectively, be effectively becomes carbon negative, which is not a technical term. The, the technical term is carbon abatement. Uh, the carbon abatement potential for the HAZER process on biogas is quite significant. It's actually um, up to 150 tons of CO2 equivalent per ton of hydrogen produced. So what this means is that um, in addition to using the hydrogen as a, uh, as a zero emissions fuel for, for example, transport, um, users of this fuel um, could also offset existing emissions uh, by, by this carbon abatement. So there's a carbon credit there. Uh, in jurisdictions, in countries where there is a fair price on, uh, on carbon, um, this could also be uh, a significant um, revenue stream. So, HAZER, as I mentioned, um, comes from UWA, um, our current CTO, our Chief Technical Officer, uh, Dr. Andrew Conejo, did his PhD on what is now the, the HAZER process uh, back in the late um, 2007, I believe. The company was, uh, was formed in 2010. Uh, the company owns all the, uh, the intellectual property rights to the, to the process. It was listed on the, on the ASX in 2015. We've done a lot of pilot testing in 2018 and 19, and we're about to get um, launched, I'd say, into the next phase of commercialization and the next chapter for our company, um, which is called the, uh, the Commercial uh, Demonstration Project. I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail next. Um, in addition uh, to, in parallel to, to the, the CDP project, we're already in very serious discussions uh, to form partnerships in particularly in markets overseas um, outside Australia 
um, for commercial scale applications of the technology. That's the second leg of, uh, of our strategy. And thirdly, we're focusing on, uh, on creating the, the highest possible value from, uh, from the other product, from the, from the graphite. So to, uh, to give you an idea of the, uh, the commercial demonstration uh, project, um, this is a proposed uh, 100 tons per annum uh, hydrogen production facility. Um, I'm mindful that that not, might not mean much um, to most of the audience today, but 100 tons per annum of hydrogen is, uh, is about enough fuel to power an, uh, an initial demonstration fleet of buses. So eight to 10 uh, buses could be powered by the amount of hydrogen produced from, uh, from this plant. The facility will be uh, located at Woodland Point Wastewater Treatment Plant on, and operated by, um, by the Water Corporation here in Perth. Um, we, we signed a, an MOU with the Water Corporation in May 2019, and that led into uh, our application with ARENAS, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and we were successful uh, for a grant for, for this project of um, an amount of up, up to $9.41 million. Uh, contribution to the to the project. This funding agreement was executed in January and uh, as Peter already uh, mentioned in the intros, um, I am a particularly happy man uh, today uh, because yesterday we announced to the market, uh, you couldn't have timed it better, um, but yesterday we announced that we have um, executed, signed all the agreements, uh, there's a gas supply agreement and a collaboration deed, a collaboration agreement with the Water Corporation for this project to uh, to take place, um, which is a huge milestone uh, for us. Um, it's a requirement under the ARENA grant for, for these agreements to be in place, and we are absolutely over the moon that this is now um, been com completed. Um, there might be people on the line um, as well joining us, uh, maybe even some of the people I've been working with over the, the past year on this. Um, I've said this before, but the, uh, we can't emphasize how much we appreciate um, Water Corp's uh, willingness to facilitate in, in this next step. Um, you may also see, especially for the water uh, industry people, um, Master Kelly, um, the water minister here in WA, is also uh, quite excited about the uh, the project, and there is likely going to be some uh, some media announcements about this uh, this project uh, today and the next couple of days. So very timely, so well timed by Kylie and Peter for having us here today and letting me speak. I will just quickly try to go to the next slides. But, um, mindful of time, I won't go through all of them. Maybe just the, uh, the second and the third point. We, uh, we were successful with securing some, uh, some funding from the WA Government Renewable uh, Hydrogen Fund to uh, conduct a, a feasibility study um, for the establishment of a renewable hydrogen refueling uh, hub um, in the city of Mandurah. We have recently uh, successfully completed the, uh, the paperwork for, uh, for that as well, and we're looking to kick that off. And um, um, that will be a very exciting uh, initiative. Um, uh, we've joined up uh, with uh, with some very interesting partners for uh, for that project. So hopefully, be able to share more detail on that later on. Um, and the the third point on this slide is uh, is something I'm personally particularly excited about as well. Is that uh, um, we signed a, an MOU with the Chiyoda Corporation from Japan. Uh, Chiyoda is a, a very large established. Um, EPC contractor engineering firm from uh, from Japan, and we've um, we've signed an agreement for a strategic alliance with them for applications of the uh, HAZA process in Japan. So very clearly, applications in the country in Japan, um, not focusing on export of hydrogen from Australia to Japan, but um, actually generating it there. Um, maybe a thing that I, I skipped over in my rush to. Uh, to get to the CDP announcement, but uh, with using biogas as a, as a feedstock, um, we also see quite a natural competitiveness for the uh, the HAZA process as the 
the sources of biogas, wastewater treatment plants, uh, landfills are typically located in the periphery of, uh, of densely populated areas of cities, um, which also happens to be where you find bus depots and taxi fleets, uh, logistics companies, potential users for the hydrogen that we produce, um, rather than having to, to rely on, on long distances for transport, which makes it, it costly. That's another key um, differentiator, we think, of, uh, of our technology. Um, and that's, uh, that's it for today. I'm very happy to, uh, to take any questions at, at the back end of this, uh, this session or, or afterwards by, uh, by email. Right, thanks uh, Luke. And uh, yeah, technology that I think a lot of us are very excited with about and uh, keen to see how it progresses. Uh, given the time again, I'll, I'll, I'll keep moving on uh, at the moment uh, to our next presentation, but uh, encourage all our listeners, watchers to use the Q&A uh, and Luke can probably answer a few for you there uh, as we move on to our next speaker. And so I'd like to now introduce uh, uh, Sam uh, from uh, ATCO uh, as our next speaker. Sam heads up innovation at ATCO and has a background in mechanical engineering, another mechanical engineer, I like that. That makes three of us on the panel. And uh, a business leadership with over 20 years of experience in gas utilities, both in the UK and Australia. Sam was project director of ATCO's Clean Energy Innovation Hub, which if it wasn't for our restrictions, we might have been having this meeting down there today. Uh, it's Australia's first green hydrogen microgrid and is now, uh, Sam's now heading up ATCO's Clean Energy Innovation Park and perhaps when restrictions do lift, we might get a chance to go down and have a look at it. I'll now hand over to Sam. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. And uh, thank you to the Australian Water Association for affording ATCO this opportunity to present at the webinar. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to talk to you about, um, about our hydrogen journey. I would also like to acknowledge Peter Clinton on the call and thank you for that fantastic introduction, Peter, and also acknowledge our fellow speakers on the webinar. So just a wee bit about uh, ATCO, for those of you who's not familiar with ATCO, from an Australian perspective, ATCO owns and operates almost 14,000 kilometers of below ground gas distribution pipelines here in Western Australia. We service around about 750,000 customers across WA, uh, an asset value of about $1.5 billion. Our annual gas throughput for the engineers on the call uh, about 25 and a half uh, thousand terajoules per annum. We also own and operate two power stations, uh, one in Caratha and one in Osborne in Adelaide. And we most recently built the Clean Energy Innovation Hub, which is in Jandicott, just south of Perth. So very quickly, in terms of ATCO's hydrogen strategy, it can be summarized under three, in three horizons. So Horizon One, ATCO built the Clean Energy Innovation Hub, which is a pilot scale hydrogen microgrid. And Horizon Two, which I'm going to give you a sneak peek today, is about commercializing um, hydrogen production and building a hydrogen production plant here in Western Australia. And then Horizon Three, which again, Peter mentioned, it's all about the export and the significant opportunity that the export market opens up for domestic decarbonization, deep decarbonization. So Horizon Three for ATCO is about replicate and industrialize. So in terms of ATCO's clean energy journey, uh, around about 2016, we started on what we call the Gasola trial where we integrated rooftop solar batteries with natural gas fire generation and we installed the system at a domestic level down in VAS which is fringe of grid where there's lots of power outages and we demonstrated the role of natural gas in residential hybrid energy systems. Uh, just to give you an idea of just how successful that project was we reduced customers' bills from an average of around $250 a billing cycle to $16 a billing cycle. Notwithstanding that ATCO fronted uh, the capital from a trial perspective, 
but to give you an idea there. In September 2017, ATCO conceptualized the Clean Energy Innovation Hub. The project was titled ATCO H2 Micro. And in February 2018, our GASOLA trial was successfully completed, collecting all the data. And in March 2018, in our Jandicott site, we opened the first hybrid home on our site, which is a home of the future. It's completely standalone, off the grid, powered by solar batteries and powered by uh, also backed up with a natural gas fire generator. But most recently, it has a fuel cell that's uh, now consuming hydrogen produced on site. In July 2018, we successfully secured ARENA funding for to build Clean Energy Innovation Hub. And that announcement was made in July 2018. Fast forward exactly one year later, we developed Australia's first green hydrogen microgrid and we officially opened the site. And uh, just before that, we also led a hydrogen strategy focus for anyone that's embarking on hydrogen for their businesses. Strongly encourage you as a lesson learned, ensure that it's tied up with your strategy or corporate strategy. It's fundamental to get approvals to move forward, regardless of how nice your project might, might look and feel. Um, in September 2019, we launched the H2 City tool in collaboration with ARENA and KPMG. So ATCO led that piece of work where the tool is now online. It's the world's first that pulls together pretty much all information that's online into a, a tool that you can use to uh, determine what it would cost from an economic and a, tech, a techno-economic perspective to convert a community to, to hydrogen. Um, in December 2019, um, we issued our, our final report to ARENA. So if anyone's interested, download the report to have a read of the findings from the Clean Energy Innovation Hub. And in January of this year, we had our first blending of hydrogen in the natural gas network up to three and a half percent blended. So <clears throat> moving on in terms of ATCO's Clean Energy Innovation Hub, what it actually is, is a Australian first that integrates a hydrogen production plant with a standalone power system. So the standalone power system, so I'm not sure why this uh, is, is going on its own so fast. Okay, so in terms of the Clean Energy Innovation Hub, it integrates a standalone power system, which is made up of 300 kilowatts of rooftop solar, 500 kilowatts of, uh, sorry, 250 kilowatts or 478 kilowatt hours of battery storage. And it integrates a natural gas fire generator for real time balancing, but also it uses the spillover energy to power a quarter of a megawatt electrolyzer that produces, that can produce up to 65 kilograms of hydrogen per day. Uh, so for each kilogram of hydrogen it, it produces, it uses nine liters of water, or you can round it up to 10 liters of water. Um, so not a lot of water that's being used. We also have two 10,000 liter rain tanks for capturing of, of rain water to offset our wastewater usage as well as the water that we use for cooling the system is treated for Legionellas and it's also treated for corrosion, et cetera. And the water is then pumped back into our rainwater tanks, which is then offsetting our wastewater. So it's a complete uh, eco-friendly system, energy eco uh, system on, in Jandicott. Um, it also builds from our residential scale gas solar project. And importantly, it's a showcase facility that demonstrates the important role of hydrogen and our existing gas infrastructure assets. Total investment, $4 million, of which 1.7 was funded by ARENA. So just a few pictures for you. On the left, what you're seeing is um, 4,000 liters of hydrogen storage. Um, this is a custom designed pressure reduction and blending station that we designed in-house and built it ourselves. Uh, being, being a gas company, this is our forte, it's what we do, um, manage, manage flammable fuels. Um, 
on this picture on the right hand side, that's a PEM quarter for megawatt electrolyzer. Closer towards you is where the uh, electrons enter the system, so your transformer. On the far end is where the hydrogen, sorry, the water gets split into oxygen and, and hydrogen. On the left hand side, it's a custom designed uh, switchboards that ADCO designed internally as well. And then we, we had an external company manufacture it for us. In the middle of the picture is 478 kilowatt hours of battery storage. So before we actually use any power to power the electrolyzer, we actually store excess power in, in, in the batteries to offset all of our on-site electricity requirements. And if the batteries are depleted, and the sun is not shining, we, can, we have a, a, a natural gas fired generator as well as a C65 hydrogen ready turbine for real time energy balancing. So before we go to grid power, we use all energy consumed, uh, sorry, produced uh, within our site. So moving, moving on and scaling up to the next phase, which uh, is predominantly what we want to talk about today, is ATCO's Clean Energy Innovation Park. The park is actually an Australian first that's going to build a 10 megawatt commercial scale hydrogen production plant. And it integrates large scale solar renewable electricity generation with 100% green hydrogen production through electrolysis Importantly, the Clean Energy Innovation Park builds on the Clean Energy Innovation Hub that we built in Janicot. And it's going to be producing, again, a 100% renewable energy ecosystem. Um, from a large scale perspective, uh, from an Australia perspective, it'll position Australia and ATCO as a key participant in the global hydrogen economy. Uh, this project is also supported by the Australia, uh, sorry, West Australian state government, who's uh, given us $375,000 for the feasibility study of this project, bearing in mind that we are significantly advanced on, on the design and economics of this project. Um, so in terms of what it looks like, we will be integrating a 10 megawatt electrolyzer with a wind farm behind the meter. So we will be directly coupling with a, uh, a wind farm, a 180 megawatt wind farm. We will also have a grid connection and the grid connection is there to serve as a dispatchable load in case that the grid requires power uh, to be used. The plant can be dispatched as well. Take take any grid power, as well as supply power back into the grid if required. We'll have up to two days of storage. The hydrogen could be transported via tube trailers um, to fuel fuel cell electric buses, vehicles, etc., through hydrogen refueling stations. And most importantly, we'll be blending the hydrogen into the gas networks and a future potential for grid firming through fuel cells. So the plant itself will produce around 4.6 tons of hydrogen per day. Um, so getting down into a wee bit more detail, so roughly around 78 kiloliters of water to produce uh, the 4.6 tons of hydrogen, of which 37 tons of oxygen, pure oxygen will also be produced. The oxygen will be captured and stored in oxygen storage vessels, the hydrogen captured and stored into the, the two days or eight tons, in this case, um, sorry, it's 14 tons of hydrogen storage as a buffer. And hydrogen will then be compressed and in tube trailers, we will transport it to the injection points. The hydrogen can be consumed uh, for industrial users uh, such as ammonia processing, nickel refining, etc., um, as well as for heating of, uh, of kilns in, in mining applications. For example, the oxygen can be used in intensive care, care units, wastewater treatment plants for aeration, and the hydrogen can also be provided to um, refueling stations for transportation. So just a few fast facts. Um, in terms of the 10 megawatt plant, we'll be consuming around uh, 0.03 gigaliters of water per year. 
when you put that into context of Western Australia's current water consumption, that's about 0.01% of water being used. When you actually scale this up, um, when you scale it up to meet a Japan export demand of 2030, we would require around about 16 gigalitres of water per year. Now to put that into context, that is less than 1% of the water being used today in Australia's mining industry. But importantly, what an export market does, apart from create jobs and all of the uh, global decarbonization strategy, et cetera, what it does, it also provides a demand for us to provide more water. And this is where the business case for desalination could actually start, stack up to provide um, a really important base case for us to, to build desalination plants. So in terms of that 0 .0, 0 0.03 gigalitres of water, it will produce 4.6 tonnes of hydrogen which is enough to fuel 857 fuel cell electric buses, which replaces around 18,000 litres of diesel every day being consumed. Equally, the, um, it could replace around 42,780 litres of petrol that's been consumed each day, or it can provide enough of uh, heat, so for heating and cooking, to 14,391 homes. And uh, finally, it could also provide electricity via fuel cells to almost 5,836,000 uh, homes. So there's a significant amount of opportunity and our precious resource uh, is really the fuel of the future. And I will leave it there and hand back to Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. That's uh, very interesting. I, I was trying to run, run some numbers myself there on what you were showing. The, the 4.6 tonnes, is that what your, the current plant at the hub can produce? Is that right? No. So the current plant produces, can produce up to 65 kilograms or okay. yep. up to 23 tonnes per annum. Yeah. The 4.6 tonnes is the commercial scale project, which we are embarking on just yet. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah, it'll be interesting. It's, um, no, it, it's not a large amount of water uh, compared to what we supply. I was trying to run some numbers on it to, to the number of households, but your pilot plant is using about the amount of water of 200 households per annum was my rough guess. Uh, but uh, factoring in the benefits you're getting. It looks like you, you know, your energy benefit uh, in terms of say households is gonna be a lot more than that. So yeah, it uh, looks like a, it's, it's great that I'll probably come back to a comment that uh, Professor Peter Clinkin said, it's not something we could do, it's something we uh, should do and uh, can do. And it's, I think these pilot plants, uh, it, it's great that we're actually putting stuff on the ground and doing it. Uh, so thanks, Sam, for that uh, uh, presentation. I'd like to move on to our final speaker now and uh, just bring up my notes. So um, I'd like to introduce Joe Wider from the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation. Joe's a civil engineer and completed his energy studies at Murdoch Uni. He's worked in renewable energy sector since 1995, including for the WA Office of Energy, the Australian Greenhouse Office, arena and as a consultant. Joe commenced to work with WA Renewable Hydrogen Unit in May uh, 2019. So uh, welcome Joe. Thanks Peter and um, thanks to the AWA for this opportunity to speak and I'd like to also thank the, all the other speakers for their interesting talks and introductory words. And okay here we go. So um, my talk this afternoon, I'm going to provide a, a brief overview of WA's renewable hydrogen strategy um, before briefly discussing some aspects of the role of water in the hydrogen economy. Just a quick word about the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation. So the WA's renewable hydrogen unit started its life in the Department of Primary Industries and regional development. And we've recently transitioned from DEPA to JETSI. Um, 
although Minister McTiernan remains the minister responsible for the, the hydrogen activities, even though we've switched departments, she has multiple portfolios. Um, so JETSI is the lead agency for economic development, international trade and investment and tourism. It also leads the promotion and development of the resources, defence, international education, science and innovation sectors in Western Australia. Uh, JETSI's functions include promoting and attracting investment into Western Australia, uh, developing and coordinating state significant projects and infrastructure, uh, supporting the development of industry by improving local industry capability and developing industrial land, um, assisting the development of export markets and managing WA's international network of trade and investment offices. And importantly, JETSI has staff in Japan and Korea, um, which is very useful for our discussions with those um, countries. Um, and we also provide strategic advice to the government on state development issues. So just a little bit of brief history. The, the WA government has been monitoring developments in the hydrogen sector for more than a decade. Um, some may even remember the 2003 National Hydrogen Study um, and the Broome International Hydrogen Conference, which was held up in Broome in 2003. Um, in 2018, the WA government organized a renewable hydrogen conference in Perth to gauge progress in the sector. Um, this well-attended conference led to the setting up of the WA Renewable Hydrogen Council, um, which is an advisory body consisting, consisting of invited industry, government and research representatives. Um, the council's analysis and advice led to a, a report that was considered by the West Australian government and that was used to develop the West Australian Renewable Hydrogen Strategy which was launched in July 2019 at ATCO's Clean Energy Innovation Hub. Um, and we've got hard copies of that um, document in Japanese and Korean available in our overseas offices. Um, the strategy sets out an ultimate vision that Western Australia will be a major producer, exporter and user of renewable hydrogen. Um, and the strategy also includes goals for 2022 and 2040. Um, so the strategy sets, steps out an approach that is ambitious yet realistic, aiming to facilitate the growth of the renewable hydrogen industries in ways that are prudent, scalable and appropriate. The strategy identifies four strategic focus areas as the priority for Western Australia and their export, remote applications, hydrogen blending and transport. The West Australian government is actively supporting industry efforts to accelerate the development of the renewable hydrogen industry. Government actions and investment in partnerships, seed funding and fit for purpose regulatory support as well as efficient approval processes will assist the hydrogen industry to overcome its economic, regulatory and technical challenges. So the key actions that the West Australian Government has taken to support industry efforts include the 10 million renewable hydrogen fund to facilitate private sector investment and leverage financial support to the renewable hydrogen industry. Uh, resourcing in that we have a dedicated renewable hydrogen unit to coordinate the state's work on growing the industry, coordinate WA's role in the implementation of the national hydrogen strategy and all its actions and maintaining the Renewable Hydrogen Information Portal, which I'll talk about soon. Um, the unit is working closely with the federal government and relevant bodies to support regulatory reform that will enable the growth of the renewable hydrogen industry while ensuring strong safety and consumer protection. Um, and we also maintain a lot of relationships with various stakeholders um, and importantly, the Renewable Hydrogen Council remains in place and continues to provide strategic advice on the development of the industry. Um, and the unit has set up an interagency working group to coordinate WA hydrogen activities. Um, I won't dwell on WA's advantages, but we, we, we do have world-class renewable energy resources um, an established energy production and export industry and proximity to key international markets. Um, our solar resource is one of the highest in the world 
Um, and due to being on the western side of the continent, we also have excellent wind resources. Uh, the land area of 2.5 million square kilometres um, and our low population density also is well places us to develop large scale renewable energy generation. Um, and we also have world class industrial and export infrastructure that can accommodate the development of the industry. The other um, comment I'd just like to make is that uh, WA's coastline is more than what well, it's almost 13,000 kilometres. So there are likely to be numerous sites suitable for large scale desalination plants. So the renewable hydrogen projects are already underway in Western Australia. And um, Sam's told us about the Clean Energy Innovation Hub down in Jandakop and um, Luke about the Hazers Group's project that is going to be built this year at Woodman Point. Um, we've also got quite a lot of feasibility studies underway. So Yara and Onji are investigating um, renewable hydrogen production for green ammonia production at their existing ammonia production plant on the Barrett Peninsula. The Asian Renewable Energy Hub is also a very exciting project that is um, it's in the early stages of development, but it is good to see that they got environmental approval for 15 gigawatts of renewable generation recently. Uh, the Murchison Renewable Hydrogen Project that Peter mentioned as well. Um, and earlier this year, uh, Minister McTiernan announced seven feasibility studies being funded by the Renewable Hydrogen Fund. Um, we've heard about ACCO's study, uh, one in the metro area is the city of Coburn, who are investigating solar hydrogen production for their waste collection vehicle fleet, as well as some of their light vehicles. Um, we've also got a feasibility study with um, the Dampier to Bunbury natural gas pipeline, and they're examining issues with gas blending associated with their large transmission pipeline. Energy Development Limited, operates a lot of isolated power systems in Western Australia and their feasibility studies investigating options for using renewable hydrogen to reduce diesel dependence for some of their sites. Um, we've heard about the Hazer study and Murdoch Uni study. And the last one, which is particularly interesting is Pacific Hydro Australia, uh, also looking at renewable hydrogen production using the existing hydro power station system near Kununurra and driving that is the scheduled closure of the Argyle diamond mine later this year which frees up a lot of electricity generation capacity that doesn't have a, a market at present so PAC Hydro are obviously going to be looking at the economics and the options for doing something with that electricity generation capacity in the hydrogen space. Um, this map is obviously going to need updating frequently, and I'm going to have to turn it into two slides, I think, to um, separate this, the studies from the projects, um, because it doesn't also include two recent announcements. Uh, BP has also announced a feasibility study for renewable ammonia uh, demonstration plant, and Infinite Blue Energy have announced a renewable hydrogen proposal, and both of those are in the region near Geraldton, which has an excellent solar resource and an excellent wind resource. And it also has the advantage of not being in the cyclone region of Western Australia. Um, the assessment of the project stream under WA's Renewable Hydrogen Fund is nearing completion and our announcements are expected later this year. Uh, to help guide investment decisions, a renewable hydrogen information portal has been developed to provide information and mapping of renewable energy and water resources, critical infrastructure and land tenure. Uh, the portal is available by searching for WA Renewable Hydrogen Portal and users can zoom in to various areas and select layers of interest. Uh, the Renewable Hydrogen Unit has plans to further develop this tool and users are welcome to suggest improvements through the feedback function that's available on the website. Um, this is currently hosted on DeepHerd's website, um, but we will provide linkages to it from the JETSI website when we update our website. Um, and we're also planning to put some of the project information onto the portal to make it more useful. Um, also underway in Western Australia is 
some of the activities that have been previously mentioned. Uh, Fortescue's partnership with CSIRO is very interesting in the, the technology development space. Um, ACCO and Fortescue have also announced an agreement to explore the deployment of hydrogen vehicle fueling infrastructure in WA. We have the Future Energy Exports Cooperative Research Centre based out of UWA, um, and they also have a hydrogen R&D component. Um, and there's also a green ammonia consortium that consists of Woodside, Yarra, Fortescue, and the Asian Renewable Energy Hub. So now I just want to briefly address some of the water issues. So the, the National Hydrogen Study has the figures that we've all heard, the nine litres for electrolysis, and there's some figures up there for the other methods of generating hydrogen. Um, but it's important to note that these are the theoretical amounts of water based on the chemical pathway for each process. In practice, water requirements will vary depending on the production method and technology, the water content of inputs, and the additional water needs for processes like cooling and input water purification. So the National Hydrogen Strategy is obviously available on the, the, the website. But one of the links that's associated with the National Hydrogen Strategy is all the consultancy reports that went into developing the National Hydrogen Strategy. Um, and there's a lot of useful um, reports available from the National Hydrogen Strategy website. And one of them is the ARUP um, Hydrogen Hub Study. Um, so they went further detail into the water requirements and pointed out that the, the nine litres per kilo is actually the demineralized water. So obviously your input water quality is going to determine how much water is needed to get that demineralized water. Um, and they gave a figure of approximately 15 to 20 litres of potable water uh, per kilo. And obviously that's because you need to have a waste stream of water to take away the minerals that you've taken out of the water. Um, interestingly, this hydrogen hub study also spoke well, consulted with stakeholders and surveyed stakeholders, and these were mainly um, companies that were interested in developing hydrogen proposals. And interestingly, 45% of respondents identified wastewater as their first preference for hydrogen production. And then desalination was also extensively mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and potable water was not considered feasible by many people, but it was also identified for pilot projects. Um, potable water was obviously going to be a, quite a useful start for you know, doing the small scale pilot projects. Um, but yeah, the large scale projects are all factoring in desalination. Another useful report on the National Hydrogen Strategy website is the Geoscience Australia report um, that looked into prospective areas for hydrogen production around Australia. And the first map there on the right um, highlights the importance of groundwater in supplying Australia's water consumption needs, with the orange areas being regions where groundwater is more than half of supply. So the Geoscience Australia have the report has a lot of maps and what they did was then overlay them to work out where the prospective areas for hydrogen production are. Um, the map on the left is the hydrology of Australia's aquifers. Um, and I've shown only one of their um, heat maps, which is the one that assumes desalination is used for large scale hydrogen production um, and existing infrastructure. And green is obviously the areas with the most potential. Um, but just to give some context on the water, Replacing Australia's 2019 LNG exports with renewable hydrogen would require around 280 gigalitres per annum, which is less than half of what the Australian mining industry currently consumes. Um, desalination is estimated to add about 2% to the cost of renewable hydrogen production. And that's hence why a lot of the large scale um, proponents are looking at desalination options. And another interesting um, statistic is the Pilbara actually has 140 litres of gig 
140 gigalitres per annum of groundwater available from iron ore mine dewatering activities. And if that quantity of water was used for producing hydrogen, it would produce around 14 million tonnes of hydrogen per year. Um, and there's also um, research underway to directly produce hydrogen from seawater. Um, but obviously there's a lot of challenges in that approach and that's probably a more of a, a long-term option. <clears throat> and finally, it's also worth noting that any projects will be required to obtain environmental approvals and water considerations will be a key component of this. And to finish off with, I'll just say that domestically, hydrogen is well placed to play an important role in complementing other technologies in a future energy mix with costs of production for renewable energy falling, renewable hydrogen is likely to emerge as a viable proposition in some areas, which obviously depends on oil and carbon price trends over the decade. And supported by our technical and environmental expertise, modern industrial zones and some of the world's largest ports, WA is ready to discuss investment opportunities. And thank you. Back to you, Peter. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, yeah, it's a great thorough uh, wrap up of, of what we're, what the state government is driving here in uh, WA and a lot of opportunity. I think what, I think you've, you've, you've touched on a lot of the issues and I'm just monitoring a lot of the questions that have come through. And certainly in this forum, a lot of interest in the water, the source of that water and the quality of the water. Uh, unfortunately, given time, we're not gonna have the chance to go into those in any more detail today. Uh, I mean, our, our intention today with this webinar was really to just give those in the Australian Water Association a flavour of what's happening in the hydrogen space and get a taste of the water uh, involvement in that industry. And I think we'll be uh, looking to do more of these seminars and further investigation in this subject because there's a, definitely a lot of interest uh, in that water question around the hydrogen economy and I think it's uh, to me it's looking quite viable uh, and uh, exciting. Uh, so I, I, with that I'll, I'll, I'll just a wrap up to thank again all the speakers for coming along. Um, Professor Peter Clinken, our Chief Scientist of Western Australia, Dr Martin Ander at Murdoch University, uh, Luke Cox at the Hazer Group, Sam Lee Moen from ATCO and, and lastly Joe Wider from Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation. Uh, thank you very much for the time uh, that you've put into uh, telling us your stories around this really exciting subject. Uh, on behalf of the Australian Water Association, I, I thank you uh, for coming along and sharing that with us and I'm sure it'll generate a lot more follow-up discussion um, and sessions and the like. Uh, and that's, uh, I guess, Probably for the time being, uh, it'll be more webinars, but I think, uh, no, they're a good forum. We're certainly exploring this more in the uh, Australian Water Association. And uh, I'd like to bring to your attention that for the month of June, uh, we'll be running uh, an online webinars of our Oswater program. So for those that know, Oswater is our largest uh, water conference held every year. It was due to be held in Adelaide in May this year, but uh, unfortunately we had to cancel. But what we have been able to do is grab a fair chunk of the talks, uh, podcasts, workshops that were lined up, and we've put them into some online online forums uh, through the month of June. It's uh, They're live, so you'll have Q&A opportunity. Uh, and if you register, you'll also then have access to the papers and, and watching the webinars afterwards. So encourage you to jump on and have a look at that. It's uh, essentially Tuesday mornings and Thursday afternoons through the month of June. So uh, jump on and register and uh, uh, have a listen to quite a wide range of topics in the water industry. And uh, finally with that, I'd just like to thank again, everyone for participating and all the people that did register and come along to listen to this. Uh, we had over a hundred registrants listening in today. So thank you very much for registering. Uh, this webinar stuff's pretty great. I think if it was a local event here in Perth, we might've only got 30 or 40 people. So the power of uh, online uh, proves valuable in spreading your message. I uh, look forward to seeing you uh, and collaborating with you again on another online event uh, with the Australian Water Association. Thanks for your time.